some glasses, you wouldn't be able to tell us apart, would you? We both have good taste, and we both like cheap shirts at Sam's. <laughs> All right, well, how's everybody doing today? Good, good. Well, good to see each and every one. See, I'm going to find my bullets in there for a second. Well, why? I'm glad you're here, but I tell you what, uh, it's all Rachel's fault. I ate too much spaghetti. I tell you what, if y'all missed a fine meal, that baked spaghetti, but it gets me every time. It just makes me eat so much. Uh, so service may be short tonight. You know, I'm, I'm about ready to go to sleep. So, uh, And I'll try not to uh, preach y'all to sleep tonight. But um, just to give you a couple of announcements. All right, so Sunday night. Oh, I'm excited. It's the last time I get to announce this except for Sunday morning. The cake auction. Now, I'm going to read y'all something, okay? We have seven cakes. I got six of them listed, and I guess the other one's a mystery cake. But first one, a Hershey bar cake. Couldn't we stop right there and just, you know, have revival right there? Chocolate cake. We have a carrot cake. and mm, Pineapple cake. A ho-ho cake. Now, somebody's got to help me out here. Chocolate. Chocolate's involved. That's all you had to say. Chocolate's involved. And then she went just like this, so that just, that sounds amazing. And then a pig picking cake, all we need is the pig, right? And I do not know what the last cake is, but I am pumped and excited. Hey, look, I've been hearing that there's going to be some of you outbid, all right? So look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're not going to outbid me on Sunday night, all right? No one did it, so you're not too confident. Okay, good, good. Be here Sunday night. Invite people. We want to get a bunch of people up there. Now, I will tell you this. Um... We may have to settle for me being the auctioneer. Um, I've never done an auction before. Uh, it will be slow enough where you can hear it. It will not be. It's going to be, who'll give me one? Anybody over here want to give me one? You know. So if anybody wants to make any side deals with me, see me after the service. I heard that the auctioneer is going to be paid in cake, so that's the only reason I was wanting to do it. But be here Sunday night about that really pumped. Be praying about revival coming up. Uh, Benny Hartley and Hemet Patel, uh, I know that's going to be exciting, but I tell you what, they're not going to bring revival with them. we got to pray. we got to bring it down from heaven with prayer. So let's go ahead and start tonight, and hopefully we've been praying for it, but praying that, hey, revival will speak to me. It's good to pray for our neighbors. That's awesome. Let's do that. But I tell you what, it talks about how you can draw a circle, stand inside the circle and say, Lord, send revival inside this circle, and that's what each and every one of us need to do. Uh, ladies, you can continue to sign up for the Ladies Craft Day, uh, if you would. Um, also, uh, y'all have been doing a great job bringing in the things uh, uh, for the college students. Uh, the tote's actually full. We may have to put another tote there or empty that one out and put a, a new one there or whatever. But thank you so much for doing that. Please continue to bring those. We're going to continue that through the rest of this month. Uh, homecoming's coming up October the 16th. And I tell you what, let's pray for those that are going to the adults wild trip. Uh, I heard that that's an awesome time, and y'all signed up for that last year. Y'all were so excited about it. But keep in mind all the prayer requests, a lot of things going on. I know Brandy uh, wants us to continue to pray for her. She has different things going on with her eyes. Uh, got a chance to see Edna Brooks last week, and she was in good spirits, but maybe not quite as joyful as she's been in times past when I've been to see her. So uh, pray for her if you would. Uh, you will be having your pastor back to preach to you this Sunday. Thank you for not standing up and shouting hallelujah, okay? Thank you for enduring me, uh, but really excited to have their family back. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Doug, do you mind opening this up in prayer? Amen. Well, it's great to have you all here tonight. Let's all stand as we sing hymn number 223, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm 
standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Thank you for singing this evening. You all may be seated. Thank you so much, Twinsy. All right, if you would take your Bibles and turn to Ezekiel, if you would, chapter 26. Oh, thank you, Everett. I probably should have mentioned this before, but um, does anybody have any prayer requests? Any updated information we can have on anybody that you would like to uh, report tonight? Any prayer request? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Jimmy Newman. Okay. Still needs our prayer. All right. Yes, ma'am. Really? Okay. The Doug Parker family, as he passed away. Did they, they already had his funeral today. Was that today? Okay. All right. Anybody else? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what's his name? Robert, okay. Pray for Robert, has terminal cancer. Redford, okay, all right. Are you sure you're all friends? I'm just praying, I'm just praying. I'm just praying. <laughs> I tell you what, that's a tough time on a family. Let's pray for the entire family, not, not just them. All right, anybody else? Okay, well, we just prayed, so I'm not going to pray again. Nobody get mad. I probably prayed a little bit too early right then. Probably should have took a uh, prayer request. But y'all know I have to, I'm changing things up just to keep you on your toes is what it was. But um, yeah, y'all make sure I'll get by and tell Rachel thank you so much. I can't believe you were able to make that baked spaghetti without Brad there in his apron, though. Uh, so, but uh, you did pretty good. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> too good. Exodus chapter 26, if you would. We do have a uh, Exodus, Ezekiel. I'm all over the place. I'm, I'm just trying to find my notes right now. I'm trying to buy time. And there it is. I wrote the prayer requests on them, and I couldn't figure out where they were. I'm like, I am in trouble. Get everything situated here. All right. So let's go ahead and pray again. To ask the Lord's blessings on the service tonight. And uh, I'm going to try to teach you something tonight. And maybe it'll be a blessing to you. I pray it will be. Lord, I pray you're blessed tonight for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I, did, I do have a PowerPoint tonight because I tell you what, Sunday night, uh, trying to uh, describe the 70 weeks of Daniel, uh, I believe it would have went maybe a little bit better if I'd had a handout or possibly a PowerPoint. So I apologize if I didn't explain that well. We talked about the, the 283 years and the pause and uh, anyway, there was a lot going on, um, but I appreciate y'all's patience with that. We got seven more years to go on that, and that's going to be the tribulation, great tribulation, um, but uh, that's why we have a PowerPoint tonight. Now, amazing cities around the world, amazing cities around the world. Somebody, I'm going to get you involved tonight. When, when you hear amazing cities, what do you think of? Not you, Everett. <laughs> he was in the service this morning, that's why I'm asking <laughs> 
Then you think of an amazing city. It's not a trick question, I promise you. Paris. Paris. Oh, he went right outside the country. He's such a, he's such a romantic. That's why, Paris. Yeah. New York. Absolutely, New York. Never been there. Can you believe that? I saw it from afar one time. What's that? London. All right, London. Dubai. Yeah. Dubai. All right. Somebody said Dubai. All right. Ever, did you tell him to say that? I can't trust that boy with nothing. I tell you, Dubai. So Dubai, I've been actually looking into that, and that place is an amazing place. Uh, you look at pictures of it, and it's just immaculate. Now, Dubai, uh, they are a rich, rich country, and I'm going to give you some facts about that in a few minutes, but um, right here we have in Dubai, this is the tallest building in the world. I pronounced it wrong this morning. Let me see if I get it right. The Burj uh, Khalifa. Did I do good this time? All right. he, he corrected me in class this morning. Can you believe that? The student correcting the teacher? He was right, though. It's 2,717 feet high, 163 floors. And just to give you something to compare that with, the Empire State Building to the tip is 1,454 feet. So uh, the Burj Khalifa. Uh, in Dubai, the tallest building in the world. I thought that was neat. Not, next, we had the Palm Jumeirah. All right, so this is a man-made island where they, you, got, you can actually live on this. Uh, you can, uh, they have, uh, I don't think they have a mall, but there are apartment buildings, there are stores, there are spas. And this is so large, you can actually see this from outer space. Some of y'all are like booking your planes to Dubai now. Pirates and Pixie does. Can they get us to Dubai? All right. She said, yeah, she can do it all, all right? Uh, I want to show you something that's really neat here. So this is a project, the next big project. You either go big or go home in Dubai. This is a moon resort that's going to be finished in four to five years. It only costs $5 billion to, uh, to build this resort. Uh, but they believe that they can fit uh, 2.3 million uh, guests annually at this place. And actually, there are 300 rooms that are going to sell here. So if you want a permanent residence at Dubai, you want to go on vacation, uh, you can have one of those 300 rooms. I did not price them out. I don't think that the computer could actually show the number of zeros that's probably on those rooms. Uh, so that's coming up. Uh, if you don't want to go to Dubai, do not worry. Um, they're going to be building one in Las Vegas as well in the future. Uh, not saying you should go to Las Vegas and gamble away all your money, but uh, Moon Resort. All right, so something that's really neat. I want to show you the police cards in Dubai. Some of y'all may be wanting to join the force in Dubai. This is your police car in Dubai. Uh, I almost want to uh, become a policeman. Uh, but I heard they had to run, so I don't want to do that. Uh, but I, that is really... I'm going to give you some interesting facts about Dubai. There are no personal or income taxes in Dubai. And to that, we should all say a hearty amen to that. Woohoo! Jacqueline got punting about that. They have ATMs in Dubai, but not for cash. They have ATMs for gold in Dubai. Now, y'all have seen these people in the United States that are back up their pickup trucks to ATMs and hook it up to it. I believe I would do that in Dubai, knowing that thing is full of gold. In Dubai, the price of gas is only slightly higher than the price of water there. Uh, now, they are in the desert, so water might be pricey there. I'm not sure about that, but I thought that was neat. They have a minister for happiness. How would you like that job? A minister for happiness. Anybody want to be the minister of happiness for here at Belvoir? I thought you raised your hand, Cole. No, he's like, no, I'm happy enough here. I don't. Uh, Minister for happiness. All right, so if you're thinking about going to Dubai, guys, I wouldn't recommend it because in Dubai, there are 2.3 males to every female uh, there. So any single guys, you, you're probably not going to, and most of them have multiple wives anyway uh, over there, so it'd be hard to find you a uh, spouse there. Uh, if you want to go to Dubai, I would caution you, Dubai is where the little uh, green pin top is. If you look there, Saudi Arabia. Look above you, Iraq. <laughs> look to the right of you, Iran. So uh, if you go, I probably wouldn't have a cross necklace on or anything. You may be beheaded. I don't know how it goes there, but it doesn't sound too good. But Dubai, rich, rich, rich city. 
We're going to be talking about the Dubai of the Bible tonight. That's at least what I'm calling it. I am so proud of this title. They're always asking me for titles upstairs, and most of the time I'm like last minute, you know, maybe coming up with something. I am so proud of this title. I don't know what to do with myself. Not a good year to have a flat tire. I probably should have gave that at the end of the service so you know what's going on, but um, I thought that was the way. I almost called it. We'll see. I wrote it down. Um, God will not spare tire. Oh, my goodness. It's going to be a rough night. Okay. I am sorry. All right. So, t- <laughs> so tire was the Dubai of the Bible, wealth, riches, beautiful buildings, and monuments. It was on the Mediterranean Sea just north of Israel. So there you had the kingdom of Israel there. And right above it, you have Tyre right there. Something else neat about Tyre is you look there, uh, there's Tyre. But also, there were two tires, actually. (laughs) And I didn't mean it to come out that way. Two tires, all right? So you had Tyre, the mainland. But then about a half mile off the mainland was the island of Tyre. Okay, that's going to come into play in a few minutes. Uh, Tyre, one reason why they were so rich is because they served the whole Mediterranean Sea area. The Phoenicians are what made it good. They built these ships that could go really far. And if you look, you can see the Mediterranean Sea goes way over here. So there was a lot of land that they would import stuff and export stuff. A very, very rich coastal town uh, of Phoenicia. So here in Ezekiel chapter 26, we're going to be reading about Tyre. And really, it deserves a whole chapter being read, but we're going to go through maybe the first 14 verses. I know it's a lot of reading, but uh, I think we need to have that tonight in order to get the clear picture on there. So look with me in verse 1, if you would. It says, And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, because it Tyrus. Now you're like, Tyrus? So who's that? That's another name for Tyre. So we're talking about the same thing, Tyrus and Tyre, okay? Has spoken against Jerusalem. Aha! She is broken. That was the gates of the people. She has turned unto me. I shall be replenished. Now she is laid waste. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee, as the sea causeth his waves to come up. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea, for I have spoken it, uh, saith the Lord God. And it shall become a spoil to the nations. And her daughters which are in the field shall be slain by the sword, and they shall know that I am the Lord." For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings from the north, with horses and with chariots and with horsemen and companies and much people. He shall slay with the sword thy daughters in the field and shall make a fort against thee and cast a mount against thee and lift up the buckler against thee. And he shall set engines of war against thy walls, and with his axes shall break down thy towers. By the reason of the abundance of his horses, uh, his horses, their dust shall cover thee. Thy walls shall shake at the noise of the horsemen, and of the wheels, and of the chariots. When he shall enter into thy gates, as men enter into a city wherein is made a breach. With the hooves of his horses shall he tread down all thy streets. He shall slay thy people by the sword, and thy strong garrisons shall go down to the ground. And they shall make a spoil of thy riches, and make a prey of thy merchandise. And they shall break down thy walls, and destroy thy pleasant houses. And they shall lay thy stones, and thy timber, and thy dust in the midst of the water. And I will cause the noise of thy songs to cease, and the sound of thy harps shall be no more heard. And I will make thee like the top of a rock. Thou shalt be a place to spread nets upon. Thou shalt be built no more. For I, the Lord, have spoken it, saying the Lord God. So if you're reading the book of Ezekiel, it starts out with a judgment against Israel, against Judea, against Jerusalem. And God is pronouncing some judgment on his people. But then later on in the chapters, we see that he starts to spread out to other nations. Now we come here to chapter 26. This is tough. This is heavy. (laughs) 
I mean, if you go through and read the rest of the chapter, it doesn't slow down. It only gets worse. In fact, uh, three chapters are devoted to the destruction of Tyre or Tyrus. In, verse, in chapter 27, there's a funeral dirge uh, for Tyre, which is a, a, a lamenting, a song of lamenting for Tyre. And if you read it, it, it's pretty depressing. It's like a eulogy before the funeral. And then in chapter 28, it goes and starts talking about the specific king of Tyre. And then it talks about the ruler of Tyre. And that's an entirely different sermon there. But in chapter 26 is the one we're going to be concentrating on. Why in the world... Did this happen? In fact, there's some questions we're going to answer tonight. First question is, why was this judgment handed down? You know, why, why would God say all these things are going to happen, they're going to be knocked down, wiped out, totally demolished? Why did he say this was going to happen? All right, so I believe we find that in verse 2 of chapter 26, if you'll follow along with me. Son of man, because that Tyrus had said against Jerusalem, Aha! She is broken. That was the gates of the people. She is turned unto me. I shall replenish. Now she is laid to waste. So, how many of you have siblings in here? Okay? All right. Everett and Reagan, I'm not going to make you stand up or anything. I'm going to use y'all for a point, okay? Have y'all ever... And just talk to me. Nobody else is in here, okay? Just talk like it's just me. Have y'all ever gotten in trouble? Okay. All right. I think I can trust you on this one. He's saying yes. He is. Now, Reagan, has ever, ever gotten in trouble? And he's over there, and either mom or dad's got a finger in his face, and it's like, you know, you're just telling them something, and you're over there talking... <laughs> laughing at him. I don't know why, but I can picture that. There's nothing wrong. That's good, girl. All right, so i tell you what would happen with me if I was younger and my brother maybe was getting fussed out by mom or dad and he was about to get him a whooping. I'm not going to ask you all if you've ever had a whooping. I know you haven't. I'm just kidding. Uh, and he's sitting there fussing and it's, you know, how dare you do this? You stole this, took that, or whatever. And I'm over to the side and I were to go, ha, ha. Do you know what happened to me? You do. I don't know how you know, but you're right. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what would happen. I would get my head under an arm like this, and I would get my rear fried. So what God is saying here is, hey, he's pronouncing judgment on Israel. And there's some bad things going to happen to Israel, Judea, and, and, and Jerusalem. And then God says in verse 2 that Tyrus is over to the side going, aha, did you read that in verse 2? That's exactly what we read, going, aha. Uh-huh. And actually, Tyre, or Tyrus was trying to take advantage of the situation of where Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. And God said, no, uh-uh. It's kind of like my mama, you know. She, she, she can, fu- I got, I got uh, a bunch of brothers and one sister, all right? Five brothers, one sister. Did I get that right, honey? Okay, all right, she's counting too. That's a shame. Uh, <laughs> I had to sit there and think about it. But, you know, she can fuss at each one of us, but if I'm going to fuss at my brother or my sister, she says, nah, that's my child. I'm like, well, I'm your child too. Well, they're my child too. So God is saying, I can discipline them. I'm going to tell them what's going to happen to them, but I tell you what, you better not. And Tyrus was mocking God's people. You, you better be careful if you mock God's people. You know, God's serious about looking out for his children, He was chastising them, but he said, look, you better not take advantage of this situation. So for the next three chapters, God is prophesying and saying, okay, you're next, is what God is saying to Tyrus. In chapter 6, we see uh, the destruction that's going to be happening. So next question is then is, has this happened yet? Has it happened? Is it going to happen? Because we know if God said it, it's going to happen. Amen? Amen. But has it happened? So we know that in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Jerusalem. All right, we know that from history. Something we may not be quite as familiar with is around that exact same time, when he got finished with Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar turned his eyes toward Tyre. Why would he do that? Why would he not do that? He's Nebuchadnezzar. He's all about riches, and Tyre is one of the richest 
uh, cities in the entire world at this time. So he attacks. He attacks and tries to overtake him for 13 years. Nebuchadnezzar attacks Tyre. Eventually, he gets through to mainland Tyre. He destroys the city, wipes it out. But what he couldn't conquer was the island city of Tyre. He could never defeat him. Eventually, they actually came to some kind of agreement where they had a, a sort of con conditional surrender. So he couldn't overtake him. But the thing about it is the Bible is specific about what would happen. So there were some terrible things. You, could, you read horror stories about chariots running over people in the streets. You can read in history about how people were slayed in the fields. Uh, they, the Babylonians used different inventions to attack the gates and walls. But we look in verse 4, it says, And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. Well, that didn't happen with Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 5, it says, It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. And it shall become a spoil to the nations, huh? That didn't happen. Look in verse 12. And they shall make a spoil of thy riches and make the prey of the merchandise, and they shall break down thy walls and destroy thy pleasant houses, and they shall lay thy stones and thy timber and thy dust in the midst of the water. Well, Nebuchadnezzar didn't throw anything into the water. Look in verse 14. And I will make thee like the top of a rock, Thou shalt be a place to spread nets upon. Thou shalt be built no more, for I, the Lord, have spoken it, saith the Lord. Well, that didn't happen. So I guess it's a partial fulfillment of prophecy. I guess the Bible's wrong. The end. Let's go home, right? Well, never count God out. When he says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. Around 250 years later, that's when things get really... Uh, interesting. Because if you look in verse 8 and 9, I want to point out something to you that really jumped out. In verse 8, it says, He shall slay with the sword. Look in verse 9. And he shall set engines of war against thy walls. That did happen. But then you look down in um, verses uh, 12, and they shall make a spoil of thy riches. Even back to verse 4. And they shall destroy. So we go from singular to plural. So what, what does that mean? It's almost like there's a transition between verses in 11 and verse 12. There's an ancient historian named Diodorus or Diodorus Siculus. He wrote extensively about something that happened around 332 BC. Now last week we talked about the east gate of Jerusalem if you were here. Um, we read about how, how it is sealed up and it came so many times so close to being destroyed. All right, the Bible prophesied that that wasn't going to happen until the Messiah come back. We read about that. But if you remember, there was a young man who came against Jerusalem who was very close to busting down the east gate when a young rabbi came out and showed him where he thought he was in Bible prophecy. This guy believed it, so he didn't destroy the gate. Does anybody remember who that is or was? You can say it, Everett. Alexander the Great. So like Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander the Great, after he got finished with Jerusalem, he turned his eyes to Tyre. In fact, he sent word to Tyre and said, I want to make a sacrifice in your uh, temple. Tyre worshipped someone called Heracles, the son of Zeus. You're like, well, that sounds familiar. He was referred to somebody else in Rome. Anybody want to take a guess? I don't ever have to answer all these now. That's just cheating. Hercules. Who said that? Pat yourself on the back. Hercules. Good job. <laughs> you can do it for Hercules. All right, so they worship Heracles. Heracle, I don't even know how I said it a while ago. Heracles. I think is what I called it a while ago. And uh, he said, I want to make a sacrifice there. And Tyrus, they had built themselves back up. That wasn't fulfilling the Bible prophecy. And they were so secure in their borders because they had these giant walls, especially at the city of Tyre out on the island, that they said, no, you can't. You don't tell Alexander the Great, no. So Alexander the Great came and attacked Tyre. And it took time, and he was angry because it took time. He finally bust through the gates of mainland Tyre, and much to his chagrin, nobody was there. 
They were gone. I almost said they were re tired, but anyway, that's not the thing. They were gone. What happened is they had all made their way a half mile out to the city of Tyre Island. Well, Alexander the Great was furious. He had already lost men. He had lost time. So what did he do? It says that he was so angry he commanded all the buildings to be destroyed. Started destroying all the buildings. Almost you could say started scraping them up off the ground. And he caused all of the rubble from the mainland tire to be thrown into the water. And he started building a causeway, the half mile journey out to the island of Tyre. If you read it in history, it says he was so angry he put rocks upon his own back and threw them into the water himself. All right, so he started building this causeway through the water toward the island of Tyre. I may have a picture of that. Here we go. He built these tires. He's building a causeway. He built a dam over on this side. It helped uh, catch the current and uh, uh, with the current bringing the rubble and the sand. And then he had the, uh, from mainland tire, he destroyed all of that and started casting it into the sea, making their way. Well, the city uh, of Tyrus, they started getting nervous. So what they did is they started using their fleet to attack Alexander the Great's army. Uh, would have uh, fiery arrows, killed many people, and it hindered their building. But Alexander the Great, being the smart military mind that he was, called for his fleet. His fleet came and subdued their fleet. So then they sent divers. They sent divers over to the side, and they took large hooks and hooked it onto the, the boulders, the rocks, and the trees, and tried to pull it apart. And that, too, actually hindered their building process for a little while. There was actually even a giant storm that came up and broke down part of the causeway. But Alexander the Great was so focused, he continued going. After seven months of building, he finally reached the city of Tyrus. He got through, and he was furious. In fact, he was so furious, I have a couple of numbers I want to give you. He slaughtered over 7,000 people in the battle. Afterward, he crucified over 2,000 people, and he sold over 13,000 into slavery and burned uh, the city. You see here is a little example about the causeway built by Alexander the Great, how he put the dam on this side, and then he built the causeway. The whole half a mile, taking seven months, but he finally reached there. And he was so angry, he killed Tons of people. It affected over 30,000 that were in the city. And then he started burning the city and tearing it down. And we see how this is actually a fulfillment of prophecy. In verse 4 of uh, chapter 26, it said that the, I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. That actually happened. In verse 14... We read where it says, And I will make thee like the top of a rock, that shalt be a place to spread nets upon. Thou shalt be built no more, for I, the Lord, have spoken it. This is the old uh, picture there of Tyre, where people spreading their nets, going to catch fish. Another fulfillment of prophecy. In verse 19, it says, For thus saith the Lord God, when I shall make thee a desolate city like the cities that are not inhabited, when I shall bring up the deep upon thee, and the great waters shall cover thee. If you go try to find the Phoenician empire of Tyre, it's underwater at this time. Some people, it says, they say it's not a fulfillment of prophecy. You see how now it's not even an island, it's actually a peninsula. You can see there, there's a lot of um, rubble and, uh, let's see, I got a better picture of it. You can see how they have some of the old artifacts and uh, pillars standing. In fact, they took the pillars out of the ocean and actually set them back up. But you're like, Brother Justin, look, there are people there. It wasn't a fulfillment of prophecy. If you try to find the old Phoenician Empire, it is underwater and it is destroyed. If you look up what are the trades of Tyre to this day, this in Lebanon, you see that, first of all, tourism, <laughs> and then fishing. Who would have thought they had to spread the nets to catch the fish? All of it was a fulfillment of prophecy. Next question is, why even study this? <laughs> I mean, what does that have to do with anything, right? It's not talking about the United States. 
It's not talking about Israel. You know, why even study this? There's two main reasons for that. First of all, it reminds us of the sovereign God. Reminds us of sovereign God. He knows the beginning from the end. And aren't you glad that he knows the end, y'all? Aren't you glad you don't have to worry about tomorrow? Aren't you glad that there's good news, there's light at the end of the tunnel, and we don't have to worry about the future? Now, I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes I get a little concerned about the future, but I know I have a sovereign God that knows the beginning from the end that I can rely on, that if I stay faithful to him, that I trust him, put my life in his hands, he's going to take care of his child. And no matter what happens here on this earth, I've got him to look forward to. I'm glad we serve a sovereign God. It also reminds us uh, of the importance of all Scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, All Scripture, does it, did it say some Scripture? It said all Scripture is given by inspiration. It's God-breathed of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that means mature, thoroughly furnished, that means fully equipped, unto all good works. See, seeing prophecy fulfilled, have we not been hitting on prophecy a whole lot, seeing prophecy fulfilled just reminds us that every word in God's word is important. Sir Isaac Newton, who was voted the number one scientist in the world history, said, uh, there are more sure marks of authenticity in the Bible than in any in profane history. It's amazing. There are over 300 prophecies just on the first coming of Jesus Christ. And every one of them have already been fulfilled. See, there are professors in universities that are working overtime to disprove everything we talk about on Sundays and Wednesdays. Because they know, they even try to convince us that Ezekiel was written after all these things happened. They, they say that about Daniel, they say that about Ezekiel, because they say there's no way a man wrote this in the dates that are written in the Bible. But we have proof that is when they were written, because there's no other explanation except that it's a God thing, that it's a miraculous thing. Thirdly, it reminds us that there will be a reckoning one day, an account settled. You know, sometimes it's, it's hard, and I want us all to be honest with one another. It's hard to sometimes look at the world and see the way that they prosper. It's hard to see that, look, I man, it looks like they got everything going for them. You know, they're always looking happy. I mean, look at those movie stars grinning like possums on TV. They got it made. They got the nicest clothes. They got all the money. They got, man, I felt like I got all these problems, and I feel like I'm worrying about next month's bills, next week's bills, tomorrow's bills, last week's bills are already, oh, my goodness, Lord. What? Don't, hey, look, I'm going to tell you something to help you feel a little bit better. There were people in the Old Testament that struggled with the same things that you and I may be struggling with on this thought. We have proof of that in Jeremiah 12, 1. It says, Righteous art thou, O Lord. When I plead with thee, let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? In Job 21, 7, it says, Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? Psalm 94, 3 says, Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? Yet the Bible tells us to be content in all things. Yet Jesus says, don't worry about your clothes, what you're going to wear. Don't worry about your food, what you're going to eat. In fact, don't even worry about the troubles that may come tomorrow. Jesus said, be content in all things. Why is this? Psalm 37, 1 says, Fret not thyself because of evil doers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Verse 2 says, For they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. Well, I'm like, Lord, are we not going to wither too? I mean, if the Lord don't come back, we're all in this room. We're going to pass away. We're going to die if the Lord doesn't come back. So I'm like, Lord, we're going to wither too. What about that? But see, with us, like we discussed a while ago, this is as bad as it gets, what we're living through on this earth right now. Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed to men once to die, but after this, the judgment. According to 2 Corinthians 5, we're going to be judged on what we did for the Lord. You could say even our works that we did for the Lord, not based on for salvation, but based on uh, rewards that God will give us. But according to 2 Corinthians 5, the unrighteous will be judged according to their sins. In other words, 
They may look like they're living it up now, which they really aren't. But just like the city of Tyre, there is a day of reckoning coming for the world. But you know what? We shouldn't be excited about that. It's easy to look at the world and say, you're going to get yours one day. Kind of like the bully at school and say, you wait till I get bigger. Knock you out. You know, we're glad. We want them to get theirs. It's human nature. But the Bible says we shouldn't be excited about that. Look in verse 13 of Ezekiel 20, uh, 26. Verse 13. It's really a verse, when you think about it, it will break your heart. It says, And I will cause the noise of thy songs to cease, and the sound of thy harps shall be no more heard. The partying, the vulgarity, the using the Lord's name in vain, the blasphemy will, will be silent one day, because just like Tyrus, the world thinks that they're invincible. Luke 10 jumps out at me. Jesus was speaking, and he said, I believe it's around verse 14. Woe unto thee, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works have been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Verse 14, yes. And it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. Jesus was saying where he was at, you don't have any excuses. I'm here. I'm doing miracles. What excuse do you have? It's going to be more tolerable for Tyre and their wickedness than it will be for you. Well, look, that should break our hearts for the world. We had the canon. We had the full word of God. We got churches on every corner, it seems like. And Jesus is still saying, you're without excuse. And that should break our heart, y'all, that there are people dying and going to hell all around us. It's not something to celebrate, but it's something to burden our hearts to be able to get the word of God. Because I don't know about you, I was on my way to hell at one point. I was this one breath away from receiving the judgment that I deserved. But yet God in his merciful grace was so patient and allowed me to accept him as my Savior. But lest we be too confident, let's remember the same can happen to us. See, Tyre did a lot of good in his past. If you read about Tyre back in Solomon's days, Tyre supplied the materials so that Solomon could build his house and that he could build the first temple. So Tyre did a lot of amazing things. Hey, let's be careful. Be careful, don't rely on your past. Oh, I used to do some good things for the Lord. I've done some, and I've served him. I've done, look, I've sacrificed so much for him. I remember one guy who, had, he was a pastor, and uh, he had tried so hard to serve the Lord, and it seemed like his wife was always against him and stuff. Years later, he came up to her and said, I've tried to serve the Lord all these years, and you've been hindering me. It's over. I'm done. And he never served the Lord again. We better be careful. Don't you rely on the past. We better be thinking about what we're doing for God right now. In Ezekiel 27, they were lamenting what used to be. You read all about uh, Ezekiel 27, and they're saying, oh, how wonderful you used to be, Tyre, and your riches, and you go through it, 26, 27, 28, and it's named all the marvelous things that Tyre used to be. May that never be us, y'all. May we never say, oh, so-and-so, oh, and just lament over them and say, oh, they used to do so much for the Lord. Oh, how they used them. What a, how the Lord was using them so much. Why? Why would they sell out? Why? It can happen to me, and it can happen to you, anybody in here. And when that happens, our God's a patient God, but there will be judgment. Let's learn from the destruction of Tyre. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Thank you so much for listening so well. Every verse in the Word of God is important. Every doctrine, every story, because they teach us, they show us. There's instruction in it, and we can learn from it. We don't have to repeat from history. We can learn from it. May Lord give us strength to stay true on the straight and narrow for him. Lord, I pray you bless this invitation now in Jesus' name. Would you stand to your feet, heads bowed and eyes closed? No one look around. I just want to open up these altars. I always want to open it up. If you want to come and just pray before the Lord and say, Lord, give me a burden for souls, you can do it. 
Maybe you can say, Lord, I tell you what, I don't want my life to be wasted. I don't want to look back on my life and say, I wasted my time living for me. I'm going to invite you to pray at your seat, pray here at this altar, whatever you want to do. But I think it's important for all of us to just seek out our lives and look at them and say, Lord, just please show me anything that's hindering me from serving you. Show me anything that's keeping me from being sold out for you. Because I too can have a life destroyed if I'm on my spiritual toes. I too can turn my back. I too can mock my brothers and sisters in Christ. We have to be careful how we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ because God's not going to stand for it. Maybe tonight you feel at odds with somebody either in the church, outside the church, that's your brother and sister in Christ, and you need to get it right tonight. The Bible talks about our, the sun not going down on our wrath. Well, that goes not just for husband and wives. That goes for brothers and sisters in Christ, too. Maybe you need to make amends. Why? Because God has forgiven us for so, so much. He's forgiven me for so, so much. Lord, I just thank you so much for tonight, Lord. Thank you for every story in the Bible that you've given us, Lord. I thank you for prophecy fulfilled. How can this not strengthen our faith? We've heard about... Three examples lately of prophecy fulfilled. And we've learned about prophecy that's going to be fulfilled. And if, and if everything that was supposed to be filled, fulfilled has been fulfilled, Lord, how can we doubt you anymore in the future, God? We know, just as sure as you came the first time, you are coming again, Lord. May you find us working. May you find us worthy because of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, help me not to waste my life. I've wasted so much life already, Lord. I don't want to waste another moment in my life. Living for self, living for sin. God, I want to be sold out for you. I want my family sold out for you. I want my, my youth group sold out for you. I want the church sold out for you, Lord. I want this community sold out for you, Lord. And I pray for a revival in the United States like never before, Lord. God, unlike Sodom and Gomorrah, there's still so many people here in the United States that love you, God. So I pray you would have mercy on us. Oh, Lord, I pray you wouldn't destroy us like Tyre was destroyed, God. Lord, we beg for your mercy. We beg for your kindness. We don't deserve it, but we're asking from children to a father, please have mercy on us. There's so much more work to be done, God. Give us the strength and give us the desire to put you first and serve you like never before. Pray you bless everyone in this auditorium tonight and understand my voice. In Jesus' name, amen.